we're going to be talking about a problem in graph theory that was unsolved for more than 50 years. And very recently, someone solved it. So people are very excited about this. It is called Head at Niemi's Conjecture, which is a bit of a mouthful, named after the mathematician who first came up with it in 1966. I believe it was part of his doctoral dissertation. He conjectured this result about graph theory. And for like more than 50 years, people tried to prove it. They tried to disprove it. And no one seemed to be able to make any headway. But now we know it is not true. So, so I said this is graph theory. So maybe the first thing I should say is that when I say graph, I don't mean a graph like the kind you make at school, where there's the x-axis and the y-axis, and you're graphing a function or something. It's very confusing. Mathematicians actually use the word graph for two different things. So the kind of graph that we're going to be talking about is what, in most other areas of science, is called a network. So it's just a collection of nodes or vertices that are connected by edges. Some, some things are connected, some things might not be connected. So this problem that we're going to be talking about is in an area of graph theory called graph coloring. And the idea is that we want to color the nodes of our network in such a way that whenever two nodes share an edge, they're different colors. So for example, I'll just draw a really simple graph. And then if I wanted to color this, well, you know, maybe I'd start by coloring this one red. Let's see, this one, it's connected to that, so I can't color that one red, so let's make that one green. So this one down here, it's connected to the red one and the green one, so I can't reuse either of those colors. So let's color that one yellow. And now this last one, it's connected to the green vertex, so I definitely don't want to use green, but I could use red or yellow. And I've used three colors, which is the smallest number of colors we could use for this graph. And one of the big questions that mathematicians ask about graphs is, what's the smallest number of colors I can use? And this is a question that has a really long history. 150 years ago or so, people were already thinking about this in terms of coloring maps. And um, you know, how many colors do you need if you want to color a map so that no two adjoining countries or, or states are the same color? And this maybe doesn't seem like a question about graph theory, because you're like, well, there's no vertices or edges. But it's very easy to convert this into a graph theory question by just declaring that you know, each, each of these states is a node. And if two states border each other, then let's connect them. So then this question of coloring the map so that adjoining states are different colors is exactly the same as the graph coloring question. So a long time ago, people conjectured that, that for maps, the greatest number of colors you'll ever need is four. And it took forever to prove this. It was proved in the 1970s with this proof that used massive computations. And I, I think people still don't totally understand what's going on there. But we do know that for these, the graphs that come from these kinds of maps, four colors is enough. I was going to give you a couple more examples of where graph coloring can come up. Just one kind of fun example. If you look at a, a Sudoku puzzle, in case you don't know how these work, you're trying to fill in all these boxes with digits from 1 to 9 so that every row has all the digits exactly once, every column has all the digits exactly once, and each of these little bold boxes has all the digits exactly once. So you, so you might think, well, how is this a graph coloring problem? But you can actually translate this exactly into graph coloring. So the idea here is that we're going to be using nine colors. So we have one color for each of the digits from one to nine. We're going to, if, if we have a node here, we're going to connect it to all the things that can't be the same digit as that, OK? So like we have a four in this box. So that means we're not allowed to have fours in the rest of this row, or the rest of this column, or the rest of this box. So we end up with loads of vertices connected by loads of edges. And then what you're trying to do is, so maybe if we decided that 4 is going to be colored red, so all these 4s here are red, each, so we'll color all the numbers that are, that are forced on us. And then we're trying to color all the other vertices with our nine colors. And if we do it successfully, if we do it in a way where connected nodes are different colors, then what we've done is we've ensured that we never use the same digit twice in, in one of those little boxes or rows or columns. Cool. So coloring with nine colors is identical to solving a pseudocoup.
Could you use that to solve a Sudoku then? If I was sitting on the train or something, could I be drawing a graph and like, would that? You could, although I think if you actually tried to draw this graph, there'd be so many edges in it all like getting in the way of each other that it would be harder to see. But you certainly, if you had like nine colored pencils, you could certainly decide to, you know, assign each number a different color and write colors into the boxes instead of numbers. And maybe people who are really attuned to colors and visuals might have an easier time solving Sudoku's that way. And I wanna just go through one more example quickly with you, because this is gonna lead right into Head at Niamey's conjecture. We're gonna imagine that um, we are hosting maybe a series of weekend parties at, at our estate uh, out in the country, because we're very rich. So we're trying to decide who to invite on which weekend, and we want to collect together good assortments of people, like people who we think are gonna enjoy each other's company. Maybe we know each person's job, and we, you know, some of the jobs are kind of conducive to talking with each other, you know, like a mathematician and an economist will find some common topics, and other jobs are not. So if we wanted to plan out our weekend party schedule, we could start by basically um, assigning a different color to every weekend and then make a graph of all those different jobs. Like just to do a little toy example that's gonna lead into what we care about. So, so maybe, maybe the people that we're inviting have just four jobs. Like maybe one of them is a school teacher. So let's have an economist, math professor, camp counselor. What graph would we draw that would help us to have good groupings for our party? Well, um, so, you know, the teacher would probably find things to talk about with the camp counselor, you know, like managing groups of kids, and they could probably also talk with the math professor, but maybe they wouldn't have such an easy time striking up a conversation with the economist. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna link things together if they don't get along well, which, which might feel a little backwards because you think, oh, you know, if people get along well, we should link them. But remember that what we're gonna do is we're gonna use our coloring to separate those people. So we want to link the ones that don't get along. So, you know, teacher and economist, the economist and the camp counselor, maybe they're not gonna find something. And same thing for the camp counselor and the math professor. But these other things, you know, like these two to get along fine, these two, these two. So this is our graph. And now what we can do is we can try to color the graph and that's gonna tell us which weekend to invite each person. So, you know, let's start by coloring the economist red. And then we have to make sure that these two vertices are not red because they're connected to the red one, but they're not connected to each other. So, you know, if I make the camp counselor yellow, there's no reason why I couldn't make the teacher yellow. And then the math professor can't be yellow because the math professor is connected to the camp counselor, but there's nothing stopping the math professor from being red. So we can color our graph with just two colors. Erica. Were you endeavoring to use the minimum colors? Because, I mean, you could have done the math professor green there, but were you endeavoring? I could. I, um, I could have colored green. And yes, I was endeavoring to use the smallest number of colors possible because now no one's coming over on green weekend. That means that I can just loaf around in my pajamas the whole weekend and binge watch Netflix. So nice. I'm good. So yeah, we're trying to use as few colors as possible. So that's pretty simple. So let's see. So on red weekend, I'm going to invite the math professor and the economist. And on yellow weekend, I'm going to invite the camp counselor and the teacher. So that's pretty simple. But now, what if we wanted to be a little bit more sophisticated as, as a host? because we actually know other things about our friends besides their jobs. And so let's imagine that maybe we also know some stuff about their hobbies. That means that there are more ways that they could get along with each other. So like maybe the math professor and the camp counselor, they, don't, they can't really talk shop with each other, but you know, maybe they each play a musical instrument and so they could talk about that. So let's draw a hobby graph. And I wanna keep these graphs really simple very basic because when we start combining them, things are going to get a little complicated. So I'm just going to draw something with three vertices. And so let's imagine that maybe some of our friends collect stamps. Well, we're filming this in Berkeley. So, you know, maybe we should have some people who like to do yoga and some other people who like meditation. And if we wanted to 
connect up this graph, well, the people who do yoga and the people who do meditation, they're probably going to get along well. But they might not find anything to talk about with the stamp collector. So we're going to connect things up like that. And now if we try to color this graph, again, we can actually get away with two colors. So if we color the stamp collectors red, then we're going to need to color the other ones not red. So I could color them two different colors, but since we're trying to use as few colors as possible, we'll color them both yellow. So now we have a graph for jobs and we have a graph for hobbies. And we're going to imagine that these two things can come in all sorts of different pairings. So like we couldn't have an economist who collects stamps and a camp counselor who does yoga and another camp counselor who does meditation. And, and so on, all the different combinations. So now we have a bigger pool of different kinds of friends, and we have two different pieces of information about how they get along. And the question is, how do we combine them? So what we're going to do is we're going to make a sort of a, a bigger graph that, in a certain sense, you can think of as multiplying these two graphs with each other. So that sounds kind of weird. Um, you know, like how do you multiply graphs? But if you think about all the different pairings that I just talked about, you know, like economists with stamps, economists with yoga, economists with meditation, well, there's four different jobs and three different hobbies that the jobs can be paired with. So if we want to capture all the different pairings, we're going to need 12 different pairs. So we already feel, see that there is kind of a, a multiplication feel to this. So I need to draw a graph that has 12 vertices. And um, there's loads of different ways. You know, I could just plunk the 12 vertices down wherever I want. But I want to try to remember some of the structure of these graphs, because that's just going to make it easier. So I'm going to have like three vertices that correspond to The Economist with the different hobbies, and th three vertices that correspond to the teacher with the three different hobbies, and three that correspond to the camp counselor with the, the different hobbies, and three for the math professor. So those are my vertices. And, you know, and, and having arranged them like this, we can kind of see who all these different people are. This person here is an economist who collects stamps. Right? This person's a teacher who does meditation. Right? This is a teacher who collects stamps, and so on. And now we need to think about how we're going to connect all these vertices up. And so remember, we want to invite people who are going to get along with each other in at least one way. They, um, they don't need to be able to talk about their jobs and their hobbies, but they need something that's going to you know, break the ice for them. One, one compatible thing. One compatible thing. So we want to connect people by an edge if they don't have one compatible thing. If there's nothing they could find to talk about, then we're going to draw an edge, because that's going to make sure that once we color, they're going to be on different weekends. So for example, the economist who collects stamps, we're not going to connect that person to the teacher who likes stamps, because they're good. They can talk about stamps. But we will connect the economist to this teacher who likes meditation, because we decided already that economists and teachers don't get along and stamp collectors and meditation people don't get along. And similarly, we're going to connect that economist to the teacher who does yoga, because there's nothing compatible there. So we draw these two edges. And I'm not going to go through how we do all the different edges, because it's the same idea for all of them. But we end up drawing a bunch of edges into this graph. So we've, we've built this graph that sort of, that we got by, in a certain sense, multiplying these two graphs together. And mathematicians actually have a name for this. It's called the tensor product. So, you know, product, like multiplying. And they actually use an x symbol to denote it. So like, if one of the graphs was called g and the other one was called h, then the tensor product would be written g times h. For some reason, graphs are always G and H. So now we've drawn our graph, and we want to start planning out our weekends. So we want to figure out a good way to color the graph. And one thing that would be an easy solution is just to borrow one of the colorings that I already did. Okay? So like, 
we could just take the coloring that I did here and basically use it to color this graph, like just color all the stamp collectors red like that and color all the yoga and meditation people yellow. And that's definitely going to be a valid coloring of this graph because we already knew that that was a way to guarantee that people who are at the same weekend would find things to talk about. So, you know, basically I just ignored their jobs and focused on their hobbies. I, or I could have done it the other way. I could have said, I'm just going to focus on their jobs. So I'm going to color all the economists red, no matter what their hobby is. And let's see, and all the math professors, I'm going to color them red too. And color all the teachers yellow and color all the camp counselors yellow. And that's a different way that I could decide who to invite for which weekend. I can just focus on their jobs or I can just focus on their hobbies and get a coloring either way, two different colorings of this graph. But the question is, is that the best we can do? So in these simple toy examples, it's obvious that this is the best we can do. But if I started drawing more complicated graphs, it's not obvious at all. Uh, you know, maybe the job graph needs eight colors and the hobby graph needs 13 colors and then the tensor product, well, we know there's one way to color it using eight and one way using 13, but maybe there's some way that uses only four colors. So, so that's the question that we want to understand because, you know, if we can use fewer weekends, then that would be nice. More Netflix days. For you. More Netflix days, yes. <laughs> In 1966, Hedit Niemi conjectured that there is nothing better that you can do. There's no better coloring than the ones you get from these graphs. So the minimum coloring on one of your original graphs is the minimum for your mega graph later on, your tensor graph. Exactly. And this conjecture stuck around for more than 50 years. People could not figure out how to prove it or how to disprove it. Um, they did make some progress with trying to come up with a proof. They showed that any time that your, your job and hobby graphs are simple enough that they use four or fewer colors, then it is true that the tensor graph will just need the same number of colors as whichever one of those is simpler. But, but they couldn't get beyond that. So it only takes one lucky person to make one and color it with fewer colors to, to bring it all down. Right? Well, exactly. And that is what eventually did happen. Now, if you think about this conjecture, I mean, I personally f found this conjecture surprising because if you think about it, you know, so these two colorings that we made by just focusing on one of the graphs, they're forgetting about a lot of the things you know about your guests. So, you know, if I use this coloring, the one that comes from the jobs, to color my graph, well, you know, maybe there were some people who were compatible that I separated unnecessarily, like, um, you know, so a camp counselor who does yoga could have come the same weekend as a math professor who does meditation, but I split them up because I was only focusing on their jobs. It almost feels like your coloring option that you showed me there for the tensor graph was like the lazy option. It, they, yes, they are the lazy options where we're just kind of throwing away a lot of what we know. And so, so it seems very plausible if you combine everything you know you could get away with fewer weekends. But it turns out that it's really, really hard to concoct an actual example of graphs where that is true. And so, you know, decades went by and no one found a counterexample until recently um, a mathematician named Yaroslav Shitov came up with one. I'm so excited. I, <laughs> I'm dying to see it. <laughs> I am not going to draw it for you, no. and I'll explain why soon. So I'm going to tell you a bit about how he, like, the nature of the graphs that he came up with, and then I'll explain to you why I'm not going to draw. So what he did is he started with some graph, let's just call it G, and then he um, constructed, like for the second graph, you know, if G is our jobs graph, then for the hobby graph, he constructed what mathematicians call an exponential graph based on the original graph. We have our graph G, 
maybe we choose a palette of colors, you know, like however many Sharpies I have in different colors. And we think about all the different ways we could color our graph. And, and, and I mean like really any kind of coloring. It's okay if connected edges have the same color, just any way of slapping colors onto vertices. And the exponential graph is a graph in which every vertex represents a coloring of my original graph. So any possible coloring is going to be a vertex in this exponential graph. So, so there's a lot of different colorings. In fact, exponential, is, the reason it's called exponential is if I have four colors, then I can color this vertex four colors, and that one four colors, and that one you know, four different colors. And so the number of different combinations of colorings is going to be like you know, four to the however many vertices I have. So that's why these things are exponential. But then he showed that if you choose your original graph in just the right way and choose just the right number of colors for building your exponential graph, then if you take those two graphs and tensor them together in this way, you're going to end up with a tensor product that needs fewer colors than either of those two graphs. And I don't think that he spent a lot of time like really trying to optimize these, these numbers, like he just wanted a counterexample. You know, often when mathematicians are trying to build a counterexample to something, they'll just um, make all the numbers just like as big as they need to make all the calculations really easy. So I think he, he did that. And so the graphs that he ended up describing are absolutely humongous. So like the, the graph G, the, like the first graph, had like four to the 100 vertices. And the exponential graph had four to the 10,000 vertices. So I, I typed it into Google's calculator, and it told me that the answer was infinity. <laughs> so according to Google, at least, this, this exponential graph has infinitely many vertices. And um, so I'm here to tell you, actually, that four to the 10,000 is not equal to infinity, but it is a really, really big number. It's, um, it's roughly equal to one followed by 6,000 zeros. Most estimates of the number of particles in the observable universe are like one followed by 80 zeros. Then this is one followed by 6,000 zeros. OK, I'm not going to so, ask you to draw it then. You're OK. <laughs> I'm not going to draw it. And um, you know, I don't know if, if there's anyone out there who has that many friends. Just because his examples, uh, his, his counterexamples are that big, it does not mean that you need to go that big to get to a counterexample. So at present, mathematicians don't really know how small the counterexamples can be. So it is possible that there are examples out there that are of a size that is you know, sort of totally reasonable and could actually correspond to some, you know, something that you could actually care about and could fathom in the, you know, in the, in the observable universe. Um, but that is something that we don't know yet. But now we know the conjecture is false, and so now mathematicians can start chipping away at you know, like how small can these counterexamples be. He is still alive. Now, you're um, a journalist, Did, and I know you've written about this. Did you speak to him? I, I was in touch with him by email, and he said that he was delighted. Um, he, he was not at all invested in, in his conjecture having to be true. He was just happy to get an answer after 50 years. Whether you're chilling on the sofa or out walking the dog, there can be few simpler pleasures than losing yourself in an audiobook. And when it comes to audiobooks, it's got to be today's episode sponsor, Audible. Their selection is huge. There are plenty of math books, of course. Or you can go for my favourite audiobook so far, that's Endurance by Alfred Lansing. It's a cracking true story, simply told, beautifully narrated. You'll really feel like you're stranded in the Antarctic ice with this band of incredible explorers. It's an amazing audiobook. Really, give it a listen. Now, if you're already on board with Audible, don't worry, you can also gift it to a friend or family member. Let them share the joy. And for a limited time, you can get three months of Audible for just $6.95 a month. That's more than half off the regular price. You go to audible.com slash number file. Or if you're in the US, you can text number file to 500, 500. Again, audible.com slash number file or text number file to 500, 500. That's in the US. Get that great discount. Thanks to Audible for supporting this episode. I'm going to take so one unit step. If I add and every time this I vertex, take a step, 
this you might ask yourself, colors. will that always be enough? And we can prove that really, really quickly. Right? You take the infinite like, plane. Sure, you can do the first trip across the river. So I've got now a little unit of hexagons.